my name is uh, Christian Ave. And I'm Shingo Francis. And we have, we have this beautiful show uh, at the Saison Museum and we brought some images. Uh, it's great located. Um, and uh, the show is called Layers of Nature uh, Beyond the Line. And it is about, uh, it's at the Saison Museum of Modern Art. And it really brings people together. I am an abstract painter, uh, born and raised in Berlin, Germany. Uh, just arrived this morning. Uh, a few hours ago, straight here. Gladly, mm. I made it before the typhoon. <laughs> yeah. um, so. Here, a few, a few images um, of my work. It's very uh, colorful and energetic and dynamic. I paint in different uh, layers. And the beautiful thing about the show is that it brings people together. In this case, it's uh, my work in combination with the work of uh, Sam Francis, Shingo's uh, father, and. Uh, the beauty f is that yeah, one is painted in 1958, the other one in 2017, so there's a big uh, resemblance. And uh, here you can see one of Shingo's works. Maybe you want to say something about it. Okay, so you know, there's the three of us here in this one picture, Christian on the left. Uh, on the right is my father, it's Sam Francis. Uh, he's a just a little brief thing about him, he's an abstract expressionist. Um, he was in Paris in the 50s, uh, kind of part of this, uh, what they call the Informal School uh, in Paris with um, artists like Tapies. And in Japan, uh, I don't know if some people know, like uh, Hisao Domoto. Um, so he was part of that group, then at the same time since he was American and he had connections in New York. He was also friendly with the abstract expressionists in New York uh, in the 50s. And that's how he um, kind of got his name as a quote-unquote abstract expressionist. Um, so this is one of his works from the 60s. And then this round thing you see here is a uh, large drawing that's suspended from the ceiling. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a type of drawing where you could walk into it. So you're it's an installation uh, as well, so you're enveloped by this uh, painting, drawing, and there's a line, as you can see, um, at the middle of the, the drawing, and that line has reference to, um, it could be like the horizon, and about perception, about how things from a distance look very thin and far away, and then as you get closer, it starts to expand, and then the circle uh, represents time. So we're kind of in this cyclical uh, time frame where we live 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, 30 days a month, and then years, and then seasons. So we're basically kind of in this cycle. Every, you know, that's how we live our lives. So that's what it references. And it's quite huge, it's uh, 19 meters and uh, the whole show is pretty much based on uh, works on paper and, uh, and about bringing basically people together and, and, and having like uh, kind of a show of face off uh, with one another and here's a beautiful yeah. example how you like reacted to your father's work. Yeah, part of the concept of the show was to also, for Christian and myself, to do, because since my father's historical, um, and it's in their collection, and we're two living semi-young now, I used to, we used to say young artists, now we say we're mid-career um, artists, and so to uh, have a response to a, a painting in the collection. So I chose this large painting, it's... Um, Mine's on the left side, and my father's on the right side. And the one on the right is from uh, 1978. It's a period of his work that's a grid painting. And for me, as I was growing up, uh, I watched him paint these very large paintings. Mm -hmm. And he had a very large studio, and um, he would paint these on the floor. Um, so it was just very interesting for me to, to uh, work with a painting when I was growing up and watching, you know, I don't know if I exactly saw this particular painting uh, be painted, but he was doing those kind of works. And, and also, he could really paint in large scale and small scale. And I think 
like Christian too, he could paint really large and really small, but it's not so easy to do to work, go between scales. And um, so I wanted to challenge myself and do something that was of large scale. And also, the space really uh, provided for doing such a project. Yeah, here you can see some other work on the, the right side, your father's work from, what is that, the 60s or 70s? Oh, uh, no, that's from the 80s. Ah, okay. So that's like 82, 83. And um, so this is a very overall painting yeah. of his. And then this middle red one is mine. And yeah. Uh, I'll talk about that series yeah, later. So we, we were asked to do something site specific and uh, the first idea uh, was that I create a w wall painting and uh, the museum asked me to do so. I said, great, when can I come? And uh, they said, well, three days prior to the opening. I said, uh, wow, uh, I can't do that. I need much more time. They said, okay, then <laughs> one week. I still said, I, I can't do that. So I had to come up with a, with a concept and basically I painted uh, on like webs, on pieces of paper that are like 10 meter uh, long and in total uh, 12 meter wide, different, uh, yeah, like kind of an abstract waterfall because the Sezong Museum is based on the seasons, the four seasons, um, and, and all about nature. So here you can see me working uh, there at the, at, at the museum, um, installing it, um, yeah, bringing it all there. It's always a big challenge to, to, to think of something and go to a foreign country and think, is this going to work out? How does it work going to work out? How, how can I actually uh, do this? This is how it turned out. Uh, it was uh, pretty nice, a pretty nice process um, because the museum is, is one of the most important ones uh, in Japan and has this great collection of artists like uh, Rothko and um, Pollock, and Pollock, Kandinsky, and, 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 and everyone. And so everything Duchamp. is very well preserved. And then comes this young artist from Germany and starts ripping stuff apart. <laughs> and they're like, oh my god, what is he doing? Is he destroying things? Uh, so here you can see that, that I actually like really like ripped things and then took some stones from the water and put it underneath and then made it like in layers as if it would actually be like an abstract uh, waterfall and the piece is called sea song like sea and zone um, yeah and it's resemblance of that nature and then yeah. nearby also there's a waterfall yeah. called sen 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 nandake sen takuji or it's a thousand waterfalls or something yeah. and um, so and you got a picture of that and yeah. you know seeing that there's a wall waterfall right near the museum and it's the same water that runs through the museum grounds so yeah it's always like about where 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 where's inspiration uh, coming from and here you can see a little bit what is actually like in their collection and called on the r on the right uh, Rothko in the middle and uh, uh, Jesper Jones, Jesper Jones. Yeah. yeah great collection Pollock uh, Rothko you definitely worth to check out but my mission was always, it's not only to paint, it's also to, to uh, like act in space. So this is a painting I made in 2012 across from the Stasi headquarters, so the former Secret Service of East Germany. And this painting is uh, for me about freedom, blue as the color of freedom and, and hope, and uh, red in the middle, yeah, energy, uh, uh, and, and it's actually also on that street where in 1945 the Russian army drove into uh, Berlin and fought uh, Nazi Germany back then. And in that building still a lot of the former workers for uh, the um, yeah, East German Secret Service still work there. And it oh. was quite an interesting project. And so I started, uh, we had a lot of problem with right-wing extremism. Um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in that area. So and I, I said, I noticed that everyone who got engaged in art and culture uh, opened up their mind and became a better human being. So I thought, well, how about not creating like an outdoor museum and painting pictures in my district and then all over the world, but actually also like engaging the public mm. uh, uh, in it. So I did not only paint these pictures, I, um, First of all, the process is quite interesting. Uh, this this one is 500 square meters, so it's like uh, as big as a tennis court, 33 meters high, 
and there on the, uh, you can see me like with a sketch. Um, so I was painting it right on that wall, like walking up and down 20 times a day, 660 meters every day. So over a period of 12 weeks, I climbed four times the Mount Everest, <laughs> uh, which uh, I do in the project in that process uh, forget about going to the fitness uh, center in the gym come and paint with me <laughs> i lost i lost nine kilos uh, painting that uh, painting so here you can have a uh, in that black and white which just looks like an abstract painting if you look closely down on that left bottom that's me actually standing in a scaffolding you have that in color uh, there you get a, like a uh, image about size, what that uh, actually means. Yeah. You didn't use any projectors. Or no, I didn't use a projector. First, I no. thought uh, wow. also like how can I actually draw this? So, so I I just made it freehand, but you completely lose. Um, you have no idea where in the painting you are. What is happening five, ten, twenty meters above you? Mm -hmm. So I looked at art history and, and checked out how did Michelangelo pick, painted the Sixteen Chapel, and huh. he was also there painting it in Rome and the first draft he made was also wrong and he had to like demolish it and he used a technique where he first painted then on a piece of paper and put like uh, punched it with a nail the the certain uh, spots oh. like 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 where's the head where's the elbow and then hold it up against the ceiling and used like a little uh, like pigments to powder through these holes and when you took the, pa uh, the paper away um, then a lot of transformation points were there. Mm -hmm. So and I did the same process with, with, with the team and we had the fun of counting and it was 36,000 transformation points. <laughs> yeah. wow. So I love doing these big projects but what I love more is like engaging with uh, the public and over the 12 weeks I had an open studio outside on the street and I invited the public every Friday for four hours to come and paint with me and I didn't know what to expect back then but over the, 12, uh, over the 12 weeks, I had over 1,200 people joining uh, workshops. Uh, so I, I can, uh, there was clear for me, wow, there is a real demand for people that want to create, that want to understand what's going on. So that was like this kind of a start for me to, to do this more professionally. So then I started like working with, with different artists from all over the world. Here a group from uh, uh, Singapore, social creatives. I invited um, painting works together. And then I went elsewhere. Um, here um, did an artist in residence in uh, Princeton University and had like the surrounding suburbs that are actually pretty much run down. Princeton is very well off. The university is great, but what is happening around it is like Trent and Newark, New Jersey mm. are uh, kind of rough. So I organized the bus shuttle and invited the kids who have never been exposed to art and, uh, and actually cr uh, education much and, and created a program for them to come first to paint on shoes and t-shirts that they got for free so they all would come. Uh, <laughs> but then through that you can teach them a lot. First you sneaked in a little bit Keith Haring and Basquiat and then taught them some other stuff. Yeah? And, and that developed into a very great proje project where now uh, this is still ongoing and uh, uh, creating. Then I extended this, we have a big refugee crisis in uh, Europe, uh, Africa, mm -hmm. the Middle East and started to bring people together through art and culture. Yeah? Say, let's paint together. There should be a base of communication and what could be better than cooking, doing sports, doing music or painting together. So this is a group of young refugees um, with uh, German students uh, coming together. Here's some, some other projects uh, uh, I picked. This is a series of works in Germany at a cultural center in Berlin. Uh, that that was new actually nobody did come because nobody knew the whole building kind of looked like a little bit like a shopping center and just after the paintings were actually there people started coming and it's a very lovely space also for music that is in Russia uh, we created a project uh, in Perm which is the most eastern European city in the Ural Mountains and uh, they're very well educated a lot of uh, uh, yeah, good educated people, but uh, the, 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 they had a problem that especially the young women went away to Moscow, St. Petersburg or abroad and um, the government didn't know what was happening. So 
I had been engaged in a lot of community projects and they, they brought me in and I said, well, you have to change something. Um, you have to bring culture into the city. Yeah? It was an was a old weapon industry city, and, uh, but culture was missing. So I said, let's create outdoor murals of international artists, of local artists, and let's, cha let's change the whole situation. And what, was, what happened was that uh, we created over 600 bus stops uh, and really changed the outlook of the city. Yeah? In the background, you can see like that's like kind of just cold and, and not really inviting. But then all of a sudden the city changed and it was a big cultural uh, uh, approach and uh, a lot of people came in from all over. Um, the best opera in the world at the moment you can find in Perm, even the New York Times wrote about it. There was a big hub, uh, it's, it's a big hub, uh, and now they have a festival called the White Nights of Perm and over a million people participate every summer. Wow. It's a project I made in, in Miami where we changed the whole neighborhood, Wynwood, that was really run down, uh, really like a ghetto, just uh, drugs, prostitution, homelessness, nobody at night dared to go there, even in the day uh, it was hard to go there. So with a, a collector friend of mine, Tony Goldman, we changed the neighborhood and brought art and uh, um, into the streets and the concept was uh, he, he was owning a bunch of warehouses and we created the biggest outdoor museum and right now there's I would say probably over 400 paintings outside and in this uh, for people to go somewhere uh, we created jobs and there was a park and in the park a lot of paintings and there's a restaurant actually one of the best restaurants that I created and Shepard Ferry made the bar so people could come and actually go and a lot of jobs were created out of nowhere. You have now this, this cultural hub and that really changed the neighborhood and uh, created a lot of jobs. Here you have a project just from the start. Uh, me painting a big piece. Uh, there actually uh, somebody was owning a big building in, in Berlin and he wanted to have an outdoor mural. Uh, but he, w he wanted to sell the pain, uh, uh, the, the building, so he wanted to take the piece along with him, and this mm. is a little bit the process. Um, this is uh, 12 by 13 meters, so I paint in different layers. That was over the winter time, and then I um, had, had to install it at the building, and this piece is called Alansé, and Alansé means in different West African languages a very warm welcome. I painted it 2014-15, just at the beginning of the refugee crisis, and uh, just wanted to send out the message that yeah, people are welcome uh, from the cultural side. And I used this to create um, prints, and with these prints I uh, just started to build a school in West Africa, in Burkina Faso. And here are some, some, some images. Um, uh, from over there. The problem they had was that the next school was uh, over seven kilometers away, uh, very hot. Uh, you have been feeling it lately, how hot it can get, but they are um, very often around 40 and above. So walking seven kilometers is just often not an option, especially um, as one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, they have a high child mortality rate, around 10% still and a lot of young women are not educated because they have to go to the fields, help out with the family. So I said, let's change something. And uh, of the proceeds of this painting, I uh, started uh, um, with a group of friends and my partner to uh, build a school and the whole community helped. Yeah, they were very anxious uh, to create something and um, we, we did this and the school started last, uh, in the last year and um, uh, it was planned for 120 students it was so successful that we now have over 300 students and before they had about a school rate of children around 40 to 60 percent now 98 percent go to the school and um, we are very looking forward to also get the last two percent to uh, go there. What was your connection with Burkina Faso like how did you get connected to this community? Well, I've, I've always, let me show you a little, little uh, video. I've always uh, been doing projects all over the world and uh, my partner, 
comes from Burkina Faso. Uh -huh, and uh, here's some, 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 some images uh, uh, of the city. Um, there, there's a school, very lovely to see that wherever you go in the country, just before school, people start um, doing, do, doing their homework. And we did the first art lesson as well. Uh, there had never any art uh, at, at school, which, which was lovely. And we brought them uh, 50 cameras. Nobody, no one of them has a smartphone yet. Nobody has a picture of them yet. Uh, so, so we got them uh, disposable cameras that, that we developed uh, for them. Here, here you see what the school uh, looks like and was just uh, very lovely to see how people have the urge also there to create and, and to be educated and, and, and really want this uh, uh, to happen and, and, and to give them, to give them uh, uh, a chance. And, and it's so, so lovely to see that th through art and uh, education you can uh, yeah, do something like this. Ari, uh, as a little thank you for the talk today, I actually brought you one of these uh, drawings that oh. the school, uh, that the students made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The initial plan was actually not only to build a, a school, we wanted to build a hospital, but I said, I don't know uh, what does medicine mean in, in, in Africa? How, how can I, as an artist from Berlin, uh, do s a project like this? I said, then I said, okay, a school, I, I've been there, I know how, how that goes. And uh, so I said, okay, now the school was built successfully, now I'm actually thinking of creating this hospital. And we started, we, we built the first part, uh, and this happens to, to project like this. This is another painting I made right next to the Holocaust monument in, in Berlin. At the, in the background you see the Sony Center uh, in Berlin. Actually on the right there you uh, have the image which is supposed to be the Mount Fuji uh, of the Sony Center. <laughs> uh, and uh, there you can see me painting, uh, looking like Spider-Man. Um, and uh, the piece itself is also consists of blue, blue, the color of the water, of the Mediterranean, of um, freedom. From the left comes like a kind of r a red, orange, uh, fe rising phoenix. From, from, fr from the right side, the green, the color of hope. And they meet, it's, it's, it, there happens an encounter. And these white splashes are actually the abstract escape routes from Africa and the Middle East into Europe. And with that, I also made a printing edition, and that printing edition uh, goes 100% in building that hospital. Yeah? Here, more projects I'm just working on uh, with Porsche. Uh, this is a draft which I want to create right after I come back from Japan. Uh, it's a new big Porsche center uh, in Hamburg, and there I'm going to paint that on stickers and actually then want to create my first sculptures out of it and uh, all of this also oh. for the proceeds of continuing like giving back i think this is this is very very important to use the knowledge and th that is what i what i want to send out as a message to give back to community inspire others inspire you uh, i think google is a very great company has achieved a lot but i also do feel that there is a big creative crisis in the silicon valley I think there has a lot of good stuff been created, but what has actually been done to end hunger, to end poverty, to end the water crisis, I think there can be done so much more and uh, I hope you will contribute to make the, l the world a better place. My presentation is more just about my work and about um, where I get my uh, where I draw my work from. This is a painting that I've been doing and it's a, um, it's a painting that reflects and uh, what I've been interested in lately is, uh, well in looking at art uh, and looking at images a lot of times we're really looking at our screens and it's 
whether it's through um, like websites on our, our computers or looking at Instagram, Facebook, what have you, on our um, mobile phones and lap, uh, iPads and what have you. You know, we, at least in the art world, a lot of times, and also people I know, you know, we're looking at images now d distributed through the screens and through digital media and, and everything. And, and, it, and I find myself and I find others talking about how we look at art and that through looking at art, through the screen, that we feel like we saw the, saw the art, you know, like, oh, I saw this painting or I saw this sculpture. And, and in a sense, it's replacing our experience with actually seeing the real object because artworks are objects that exist in space and time. And, um, and so I thought about, like, well, what would be a painting um, that is really not either really difficult to photograph or perhaps impossible to photograph? Um, and of course, you could photograph anything. But uh, I wanted to take a, make a painting that was really elusive in, in that sense. And so this painting is painted purely with a uh, type of paint that uh, comes from mimicking a beetle's skin. And in Japan, it's the um, type of beetle that they've been uh, using to make uh, obis for kimonos for, for a long time. So from one direction, it's one color. And from another direction, it turns into a different color. So it's what they call dichromatic. Um, so they have these dichromatic paints now. And I've been using them uh, for my own paintings. But since I started thinking about like how can, we, how can I make an object that's really elusive to photograph, um, I just started purely painting with this, this pigment, this paint. And so this painting on the top part here, it's kind of washed out. But it's, it's blue and it's green. And it's, that's the part. So that's one color when it's reflective. It's the primary color, what I call the primary color. When it's reflecting, it's blue and green. And then when it's not reflecting, it's the uh, contrasting color, which is yellow and like violet or magenta or pink or what have you. So it's the opposite color. So basically, these colors just change depending on how the light is um, reflected off the painting and how the light sits on the painting. So you really can experience it just um, by taking a picture of it, because it's only, the picture is only going to reflect the way the light was at that time. Um, I think I, I think it's quite quite beautiful that in this day and age, you know, so many things are just uh, you can reproduce them, mm -hmm. but uh, values also like a lot of values are disappearing, it, it, everything is mass produced, but I, th I think art you have to see in person and it gives you something, it gives you an experience and, and your paintings are th of this series definitely something you have to, that has a certain aura you can just experience being there and yeah, th yeah I, th yeah, I yeah, think yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is why art will always stay, stay, stay valid and gets even more and more important. Yeah, and I think it's this thing about virtual and, and, and real. Um, that Well, this, this kind of painting like, forces you to um, you know, see the, the object in, in person, basically. And that, so yeah, I mean, our experiences are getting very much tangled up. And, and I kind of brought this one first because you know, this is a tech company. And um, you know, a lot of things happen online, I mean, that is the platform. And so um, yet at the same time, uh, it's, I think, kind of negotiating and navigating, you know, what we experience like in space and time as opposed to what we experience, um, um, you know, online or, or what have you. So, um, you know, and I think this is we're in the new kind of era of um, whether, you know, even with commerce and, and, and what have you. So, um, but going, just my background, um, I grew up both here in Japan and also in the United States. And as a young child, since my parents were separated when I was really young, I spent uh, my life in both places. And kind of like my segue into art was um, 
really poetry, um, and specifically this is William Blake, and he's a uh, 18th century poet in, in England, and he combines words and imagery. So, like, he always has these drawings that accompany, you know, or they could be like illustrations that accompany his poems. And um, so I was, as a young, you know, I don't know, teenager or so, um, I related to like reading these poems and like I could understand what it's saying in, in relation to my own life and that gave me the kind of the impetus to say, oh, I could do this, you know, or I could relate to this and I want to tell my own story. Uh, so I started by writing poetry and I was painting but it really wasn't something that I um, it was more something since my father was a painter. I got to kind of like get lessons as a young child and so that kind of came in from a different direction but really where I really kind of attached myself to it. The beginning was poetry and this is another example of William Blake's uh, illustrations or drawings where um, this is like the souls getting um, sucked up from hell. I think, and they're like going to purgatory or something like that. So he's kind of biblical, um, but I thought they were really interesting. And I spent time in Florence to learn how to paint uh, in the more traditional classical way and spent time there, um, you know, like copying various uh, old master paintings. Um, and then uh, when I was in Florence at the time, there was, she, this is uh, Joan Mitchell. So I was able to meet uh, with, she was an abstract expressionist painter as well. And she had a big influence on me and something like what Christian says about life. And uh, I brought, bring her up because she was really emphatic in saying that um, paint what you feel. You know, paint what it is that's inside of you, and you know, bring it into, um, bring it to life. And uh, you know, her paintings are very like expressive. You know, they are, uh, you know, emotional. I think very emotional. But it's I think it's a way to express your emotional life. And um, and then I think there's also a, a real freedom in painting this way. In um, making your own marks and your own gestures. This is my kind of early work where I was painting um, these kind of very uh, semi-gestural paintings. And, um, and then eventually I it started to kind of morph into different things and um, I got interested in uh, coming back to Japan and uh, Zen Buddhism, uh, and that is something I got interested in, in like what is Japanese culture, uh, what is the uh, um, kind of the soul of, of Japan to say in, in a way, and you know, Zen being something that's very, ultimately it came from China, but in Japan it kind of very much uh, became a uh, kind of refined form of Buddhism that has a lot to do about space. So I spent time at a um, Buddhist monastery and um, and really kind of it forced me to kind of like look into spending time with your own self and sitting with your emotions, your thoughts and um, and learning how to kind of create your own space within. It's pretty abstract, it's kind of an abstract way of um, kind of it's hard to explain in that sense, um, but I felt that as far to, as far as um, Japanese culture, that it's a big part of Japanese culture is to um, understand how space is used, and I think it's really reflected in in like for now in like contemporary architecture and design as well. Um, so, and someone that 
who kind of cross between the two cultures. <coughs> that was really influenced by well was um, Isamu Noguchi. Anybody know of Isamu Noguchi? Yeah. So he was someone that spent a lot of time in both cultures in the U.S. and Japan, <coughs> and learned a um, a very uh, unique style of working with a tradi Japanese tradition and a European tradition. And this is his place in Shikoku. It's right outside of Takamatsu. And uh, he had a working studio. And uh, so if you ever get a chance to go there, I would recommend going to um, this uh, Noguchi Foundation in Takamatsu. Um, and it's just his way, his sensibility of bringing the Eastern and, and Western aesthetics together. So, and then this is a really interesting book about In Praise of Shadows by uh, Tanizaki. Uh, his philosophy about space, light, shadow, um, and just kind of the simplicity and the way light and shadow evokes emotions and sets a scene. Um, so I'm just kind of running through these things since we don't have too much time. And then on the other hand, uh, this is James Turrell uh, in uh, his, one of his uh, sky windows. So growing up also in California, I was, I was very attracted to the space and light, light movement. And it's funny, he came to Japan and got very influenced by Japan and brought that back to California, and then he influenced California. So there's this kind of like, real dialogue going between Japan and uh, the West Coast of the United States. Um, and this book really explains uh, the art of light and space, uh, really explains the whole philosophy behind the light and space artists. And this is like Robert Irwin. So it's this idea of um, just taking perception. Um, and how our perception is altered uh, really affects the way we see things and experience things. Um, and this is an artist, Larry Bell, who uses this, he made these glass cubes and they have a certain uh, coating on it. And uh, this also, it's, it's really like another object you have to see in person where it really changes depending on how you're looking at it. Um, this is an early work of mine. Um, so again, looking at how perception works, um, there's a very faint line at the bottom, and I think it's really hard to see it with this screen. Right here, there's like a very, very vague, uh, really hard to perceive line. One thing I was thinking is like being uh, confronted with basically a non-representational uh, image of flatness, or it could be space, but you're confronted with, you know, in essence, nothing. And it's also in reference to, you know, for a long time we've been, painting's been about making an illusionistic space, like landscapes or the figure or what have you. And then uh, modernism really flattened out the, uh, the plane, meaning it, it brought everything to the front. Um, so this has reference to that kind of really either flattening out space or in Japan looking at kukang or ma, the void, and confronting uh, the void. And that's kind of a theme I've been um, very interested in with my work and I've been wanting to, um, I'm just really interested in what people uh, experience when they're uh, confronted with very little, essentially. Um, so this is like a, a show um, of what the works look like in an exhibition setting. Which was also very nice to see, or to, 
to see at Cezor Museum because we are actually quite contrary. You are like calm and in some of your works about emptiness, mm -hmm. nothingness, mm -hmm. very reduced. And I'm like more like about energy and uh, your father actually kind of like hold us together and well yeah that's build, been the interesting build, part build, yeah build, build, build a beautiful bridge yeah 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 because there's a lot of you know my father uses a lot of white in his work um but then there's a lot of gestures and action going on you know between the lines whereas you know christian is very al alive and colorful and you know a lot a lot going on um, so, uh, so I've been also just slowly these, um, works have certain compositions that come into them, but essentially most of the work is, you know, you're looking at this very either flat or deep space, you know, depending on how you look at it. Um, and these are some prints I've been doing. So, um, and this is as you go along. And then there's some color that starts to come in. Um, so more, more recently I've been doing ones, we're sti still getting a majority of a very uh, flat and static space uh, with some gestures happening at the top and the bottom. So that's really, uh, like one of my very uh, interesting uh, places where I'm really interested in is, you know, what people experience. You know, what is it when you're confronted with basically nothing? And but is it nothing? You know, is it something you're going to project onto it? Um, how are you going to respond to it? You know, what is your response? That is an installation shot of the. Uh, of the works. And then there's a body of work that has to do with this band, like you saw earlier in the, so this is one of the large installations, like the one in Saison, that you could be enveloped. So these bands starting to be about, like the, <clears throat> the band in the center being a certain space, and then on the outside is another space. So for me, it was more about the internal the, and the external. So the inside being uh, broken into another space that has more about has to more about to do with the like on a psychological level on the internal life of an individual, like what it is that you're thinking and what you're feeling, and and then our environment. You know what is happening outside of our. Um, what is going on in our surroundings, what events are happening, so things that may be happening to us and how they affect us. And of course there's a clear line between the two, yet at the same time I think they very much affect each other. There's an affect that happens between what it is that we're thinking and feeling that gets projected outward and then also things that happen outside of our lives around us in our environment that affect our internal life. So it's this play between the internal and the external. I'll just keep it at that. <laughs> are there any comments or questions? Richard. Yes. How do you know your artwork is complete and stopped painting? I'm from, from engineering. Yes. And as an engineer, there is a concept of over-engineering. And we have priorities and the deadlines. Yeah. For those that has uh, forced me to stop working on some part of software to improve it. OK, this is good enough, so move on to the next one. But how do artists decide? Uh, it's it's very difficult for different artists. The friends of mine used to say, whenever the transporter is coming, the artwork is finished. Yeah. <laughs> um, for me personally, it is a feeling. I know exactly uh, there are two approaches. One is that I like completely just create and experiment and and just go with the flow, and uh, then I know how much I have to do until something is finished. It just feels right. 
um, and when a painting is finished for me, it is finished. But there are other artists that al always go back and say, I have to do something, I have to do something. There is a German uh, painter that is uh, not allowed to visit a lot of museums because his works are in it and he can't stop. He goes to the works that already belong to the museum and has his brushes there oh and no. goes there and oh my God. says, oh man, I have to correct a little <laughs> here, a little bit there. It's very hard sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a, well, I've, I've learned to stop before, it's easy for me to overpaint something, to overly do it, you know, and then with painting it's kind of hard because once you go, you know, you, c you can't really take it off, right, and you can maybe go over it with white or whatever and try to like. It would be great to have like you know, a Photoshop go back. Yeah, you can go back in time or something. <laughs> But uh, so I've learned over the years that although maybe I want, I, you know, maybe I should keep going, but I said, well, I'll wait, you know, and wait till tomorrow and look at it again. So it's kind of like, like refreshing yourself, you know, because it's, it's easy to overdo it. That's my experience. It's easy to say, oh, man, I liked it when it wasn't so, because my work, as you can see, you know, it's, it's kind of like a less is more kind of thing. So... Um, and then you have a sense. It's like, okay, you know, same with uh, Christian. It's more of a kind of a feeling that, you know, if I do it too much of it, it's going to just lose what it has now. So, um. There was another question? Yes, I have a question for both of you guys. So, the first one would be for single sound. And I'd like to ask about, like, so when you talked about the Cezanne Museum, you say like you painted after your father's painting. And I wanted to ask like, uh, if you think about your identity and that's the reason why you do it, or like why did you do that? And then also for Alison, I wanted to ask about like, uh, when you started doing community art or some specific art, did you always have the idea of doing that since before? Or all of a sudden you kind of started feeling like, oh, I want to do that. That's all. So for the, the the painting I did in response to my father. Well, that was a concept that came from the museum. They asked us to choose a painting from the collection. And I mean, as being a son of, you know, when you're in the same line of work as one of your parents, it's like you go through like, um, and so in my 20s, I really went through this like whole thing, like, oh God, you know, it's like I have to deal, you know, people always comparing you and this and that it used to bother me a lot. like. I thought about like changing my last name. Um, you know, I, I like went through this mini crisis. You know, like oh my god, am I ever gonna like, you know, it's this whole kind of like Oedipus, Oedipus kind of thing. You know, like I have to kill my father or something. Like I have to become more famous than him or something. Like you know, you go through this whole thing, and um, so you know, I've had an experience where I've kind of gone beyond that and um, like found how I work and what's, what kind of um, approach I have. So when I got that um, recommendation, it was like, oh yeah, I, I know what I want to do. So it was pretty natural, whereas 15 years ago, I think I would have had a total identity crisis, you know, like, oh my God, <coughs> you know, like, it would have been like a, um, you know, either a competition in my mind or um, I would have probably refused, you know, would have been one or the other. So, uh, it was, yeah, it was a good experience this time. Yeah, for a question about community project, community art, um, for me, being raised in uh, East Germany in a socialistic system, it was always very normal for me to, to engage, to do something with others, for others. It was never really, like, only for my own pleasure or for my own gain or wealth. So it, it was very normal and I feel especially whoever can should give something back. And as an artist, we have a voice, so why not use it? Yeah, and uh, um, just just treat people as you want to be treated, do, do something, uh, stand for something. And uh, I feel it's very interesting also how uh, Jap 
how I feel that, for example, Japan is opening up also with the Olympics coming 2020, how you portray yourself at the soccer championship, cleaning up the stadium afterwards, leaving nice notes. I mean, this is something uh, leading mm. by example. Uh, uh, such a high technology world over here, but then still so uh, Zen Buddhism and all about nature and, 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 and giving back in, in, in a way. I, I think leading by example is um, and inspiring others is, is what we have to do. And I actually really liked how you said Avesan was the first time I heard that. Avesan, <laughs> Avesan. <laughs> we have to call you that now. I have a question. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing. It was like truly, truly inspiring. And my question is, especially in Japan, we see different forms and like frameworks of presenting and sharing art emerging. For example, now there is an ongoing digital art exhibition by Team Lab. Mm -hmm. Or you go to Naoshima and you experience art pieces, installations amidst the nature that let them shine in the new light. So I was wondering in your perception, what is the next phase of actually sharing the art with others? What's coming? I think it's very important to break down the barriers of art. A lot of people would never go to a museum or a gallery or like ask uh, uh, like about buying something or if they feel forced to like engage uh, in something. Uh, I think it should be much more normal to be taught art in school. That doesn't happen everywhere in the world. Uh, it's all about mathematics, physics and so on, but I actually feel that um, these soft values you can learn best in writing poems, uh, doing engaging in sport and music. Yeah, I mean, what can we do in a digitalized world where very soon machines can do much more things uh, at a better, at a much faster space? W what is the value of us humans? Uh, that is what we have to filter out and that is ha what, what we have to learn and, and being taught in school. Yeah? And that is really the, 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 the priority. Mm. Um, what can I add? Well, you know, these different platforms like Team Lab doing their, their thing. I, I mean, I think it's great that, you know, have various ways to, to reach people, you know, various mediums to reach people to uh, experience art. And, you know, Team Lab making their work that's catered to that platform, you know. And there's a lot of um, art now, you know, being generated through uh, digital mediums and, and what have you. And I mean, film, when it first came into being, you know, was a new, moving images, you know, where it was a completely new art form. And I think there's always going to be new forms of art forms being, um, created um, and it's how you experience it so but I think it's it's important yeah it, there's like barriers this idea about like art being exclusive or art being for oh I have to understand you know have an understanding of it um, that these notions kind of get broken down and that uh, you know and the de definition of art gets kind of tricky too, you know, well, what is art and what is not art? But, um, you know, having the ability to, to, be, to have access, you know, for museums, well, the institutions really need to, you know, step up. And some have, you know, step up and, um, you know, make it more inviting, you know, mm. so people can understand what it is that they're looking at, what they're experiencing. So. You know, text is important f in, in that part. And in education, it's true, art gets like cut. You know, it's the first funding that gets cut and usually in education. So yeah, since we are running out of time now, uh, let me maybe end up with this. I believe that art is actually, um, or artist is one of the most important profession in a society, whether it's free or dictatorian. I feel like that every big company and even the politicians should have art advisors and philosophers uh, being, you know, to re-evaluate what the culture is, where are we heading, 
um, be because artists and uh, are, are among the most free and and we are not like really like bound or, or uh, we don't have to think a certain way we are free thinkers and and therefore like le leading a way into the future yeah, and that's why I can just encourage companies and politicians to have advisors in that way and to yeah. a better future well in, in the Greeks right poets were um and philosophers for advising the council. So, yeah. well, thank thank you, Eric, and. Uh,